cool. Yeah, I mean, so I'll tell you a little bit about kind of what I'm doing. Um, I study human computer interaction. Um, so uh, basically the process they teach is like uh, learning how to find out what it's like a human centered approach. So finding out what people need and designing technology to help serve those needs. Um, so I'm really, you know, I've read, I've read some studies about like some more anthropological studies about in-person book clubs. And I really want to figure out how we can use the internet in a positive way to connect people through books. Um, and I just don't feel like there's a really good platform out there. I, I know, I mean, Goodreads is kind of how we connect and that does seem to be one of the most popular ones, but I don't think it necessarily facilitates discussion very well. Um, so I'm definitely kind of looking to see what other people's experiences are and how I could design something that would be better for that. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. One of my cousins actually went to Georgia Tech and he did um, MS in computer science. His also interest was um, human computer interaction. And he graduated, I think, last year. Um, oh, that's that was that's like really cool. Online um, program. So he also lived in Pakistan, but then um, he okay. did that. Yeah, yeah, I do know. We have an online, yeah, master's program that's, like, getting really popular. I have heard of that. Exactly. So I know a little bit about that. It seems to be a very good school. Cool. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and jump into my questions then. Um, so just to kind of start off. So are we I'm... recording that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I did start the recording. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I mean, if you want to, I can send you the recording if it's something you want to share on your channel. Yeah, sure, absolutely. That'd be great. Okay, cool. So just to start off, um, I mean, some of these questions are going to be more about your experiences. So I don't know if that's something you want on your channel, but <laughs> um, so what are like some of your favorite kind of books to read? Um, I am actually more interested in autobiographies, um, mm -hmm. books with ideas, organization, creativity, um, especially have to do with personality psychology. And that happens to be my research mm -hmm. field. Um, I also read a lot of um, stories of um, human um, triumphs mm -hmm. against um, travail and um, horrors of um, daily life and also in, der in the face of um, changing times. Um, for example, I read a lot of books from Second World War and Nazi camps. I had this, um, I don't know if that was a privilege, um, to go to Auschwitz when I was mm -hmm. studying in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was in Rwanda two months ago uh, where mm -hmm. I had to um, visit, actually I wanted to visit the genocide museum that they built over there. That's the mm -hmm. world's largest genocide memorials, burial site. Um, mm -hmm. 800,000 people died during the ethnic conflict there. So. There were like some really interesting stories about how people to pull together and help each other regardless of their race and nationality, mm -hmm. color and their beliefs. And um, basically to find out the uplifting element of humanity, even in mm -hmm. those dire circumstances. So these are the kind of books that really fascinates me. Also, I need these ideas for my own writing and write for some um, newspapers, um, op-ed columns and uh, mm -hmm. editorials and things like that uh, mm -hmm. also publish some books so you know, I guess as a writer I need this inspiration for my own mm -hmm. work cool that's interesting um, so do you participate in a book club related to those that those kind of books specifically yeah, to be honest and this is my first one actually um, I've been looking for book clubs predominantly um, a physical one where I could just go and then, you know, discuss the books and there have been some opportunities, but I wouldn't call it book club per se. Um, <laughs> as in we had this like formal name for the book club and regular events. Um, mm -hmm. I happen to be a um, member of an organization called Couchsurfing. It's kind of a hospitality club. Um, mm -hmm. And then people actually meet um, in regular meetings. I used to do that when I lived in Sweden. Um, mm -hmm. So we had like a weekly meeting. And we talked about some ideas and books in general, but it wasn't meant to be like a book club. So I've been looking for a book club for a long time now. Um, mm -hmm. So I have been on um, Goodreads for a good uh, number of years now, mm -hmm. but I haven't been so active. So I 
pretty much made my own list and, and I have a list on my website, um, a reading list that my students actually ask me for mm-hmm. and some kind of inspirational books or books who have had influence on me. So I have that, but I don't know of a book club that um, where you could actually read a book and then discuss about it and have different views and perceptions on you know, what it actually me- means. Um, mm-hmm. Weirdly, I've been part of some Facebook groups um especially these is i'm really interested in in the works of dr jordan peterson mm-hmm. um who's said a lot about personality psychology it's quite controversial but then again it's got some points so mm-hmm. we could call it sort of a book club you know discussing ideas um that he has mm-hmm. in his book um but then uh, this uh, i came to this oppressed book club in an anticipation to actually find some sort of uh um help or to be able to meet like-minded people who could just suggest new books i'm also a member of um new york best time i'm sorry best sellers uh, mm-hmm. and then also um, i'm also i'm also a subscriber of these lists from um jail publishing platform and harvard mm-hmm. um, publishing platforms so and whenever they publish a new book so i got an email mm-hmm. and then they have a roundup of what's you know best selling and things like that mm-hmm. so you you said you were in the oprah's book club is that do you like participate in conversation at all there like do you post in the forums or do you kind of just look for book suggestions through there um but i've just joined so i don't know if i have a long history to talk about but then in <laughs> general i write write about um things that interest me which are not mm-hmm. many at this point um, but I certainly look for uh, the books um, that are mentioned in suggestions or in any other threads. Uh, mm-hmm. If that's something that interests me, so I go on Amazon, read a little bit of reviews, or mm-hmm. if I can you know, find it somewhere, um, and then I like it. So this is pretty much it for so far. But I don't think in general Goodreads has a very interactive and um, interesting interface that anyone would like to, you know, relate to that very often because it's very bland um mm-hmm. it doesn't have too many options visually it's not very good and um i found it quite hard to navigate even before i was in this group yeah um so i guess my next question would be do you have like and this could this could even be just one experience or it could be one uh, collection of people as a whole. But I mean, do you have a favorite like book club or book club experience that you could talk about? Well, like I said, this is the only one that I'm actually um, a part <laughs> of at the moment because, you know, a semester is kind of hard. Um, yeah. I don't have too much time. But then, um, like I said, I have other Facebook groups where I could just talk about um, books. Um, I'm a member of some groups. Um, um, I don't know if you're aware of a um, tool called Meyer Briggs Type Inventory, where we yeah. can actually type yourself. You know, I'm some part of some of the INFJ groups. And then also, ENFP, they're supposed to be very good friends for INFJ. So there are some people that you really strike. Um, you can strike a good conversation and you know that takes you deeper uh-huh. and then we talk about books and then you know you go from there and other things but in general um, as strictly defining book club I, I think this is the only book club that I'm part of um, but I think many of those books um, it's kind of out of my genre and still not trusted. Okay I mean I would say any any place where you discuss books counts as I mean, oh yeah definitely that, that's kind of I, I mostly want good experiences discussing books I want to hear what you like about that exactly so I can you know give you a practical example also that might be more helpful yeah. which is that you know um, I've been reading a lot uh, about uh, some books which are kind of um, opposing ideas for example mm-hmm. I've been um, reading um, an all-time classic book these days it's called biology at work and um, discusses mm-hmm. a lot of evolutionary biology evidence um, between uh, different um, between men and uh, women in terms of workplace and temperament and cognitive abilities and what it might mean for the coexistence of that and then 
discuss touches upon a lot of other ideas like social constructionist view of um, gender mm -hmm. and uh, feminism and things like that. On the opposing end, um, you could also read um, Feminine Mystique um, mm -hmm. and other classical books um, on feminism. Then you just cross compare these things, and these are some things that you know people that um, I interact with in these groups are very. Um, sensitive about or they have strong opinions about that so it's really interesting and enriching the kind of discussion you can do them once you take these books and let them know that you know this is what I've been reading um, and there's also a very controversial issue which happens to be my research area also it's about IQ and the differences between uh, men and women when it comes to IQ so in general um, if you have a bell curve the 10 person on the lowest side would be men also and then person on the highest side also would be men. Uh, but then in between, there is no difference between men and women. And also on the higher end, you know, there will be many women. Actually on the lower end, there will be more men than women. Hmm. But if you're pushing like uh, 100, 140 and above and super genius level, then there's slightly more men, around 20% you know, more men than women. But it doesn't signify anything. So in general, you know, both have the same capabilities mm -hmm. um, and talents. But then how does it translate towards workplace? That's another story because then that are a lot of biological um, differences that are uh, apparent in how you function in workplaces. For example, that's been shown that, you know, women tend to choose work that is that gives them more time for their family and personal life. Men, on the other hand, take more risky chances um, and behave. You know, display behaviors that results in them, you know, switching their careers quickly, making more money, um, not have, needing too much personal time, especially when they're um, at their times when uh, um, they're planning babies. Men become more aggressive. Women become, you know, they need more time actually um, to themselves, to their family, which is natural, and that actually um, represents the um, pay gap. Um, which is not mm -hmm. to say that it does not exist, but then there are different re reasons which has nothing to do with social construction this argument. Now, for most people, or at least many people in the Western Hemisphere, it, it, it's a very um, daunting statement to both defend and um, also make. Um, so it, it comes uh, with um, very heated debate, but then certainly in the end, it's very enri enri enriching in terms that, you know, you get to have a very good argument about that and your understanding develops. So I find it a very um, profound experience uh, in these groups talking about these ideas. Um, but so is that I mean, a Facebook group that you're talking about? Exactly. Um, so these are um, these personality Type group. So there is an, uh, let me just actually look at for you. One is called ENFP and INFJ because they're supposed to be the best match. Mm -hmm. And one is only ENFP. So, um, you know, you could talk about different things there. You could you know, either talk about, um, well, at times the book, but then you can talk about other things, mm -hmm. memes, and, you know, all kind of things that are of, uh, are of particular interest or. Yeah. yeah. So I was just curious, I want to dive into the like heated debate thing a little more. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm interested in how, because I, I know something that's kind of like, uh, especially with Facebook groups, like this idea of kind of like echo chambers or just kind of having the same beliefs kind of collecting in a group. It, it sounds like this group maybe isn't like that so much. And I, I'm just curious if you feel like the you said heated debates, but I mean, you also seem to feel like they are healthy or you do get some kind of something positive out of them. So I'd, I'd just like to hear a little more about that. Yeah, exactly. I understand, you know, and I also can see where you're coming from um, that, you know, many of these groups are groups because, you know, people um, become members of certain group because they're looking for certain things and, you know, that kind of quadruples um, mm -hmm. the like-minded people and there's certainly, yeah element of group think um, that emerges uh, from these interactions. But then again, um, these are the groups where people actually find like-minded people because they're as open-minded and um, liberal. And certainly if, look, if you look at the demographics of these groups, uh, people who tend to spend more time on internet certainly um, are people who could not find 
people in real life or for any reason are cut off from the mainstream where their ideas are not appreciated or um, their outliers uh, in terms of their um, thought processes. So when they come online, they certainly look for people um, who they can share these ideas and their ideas are only encouraged by the people who are in the same position that these other people. So they tend to um, click with each other uh, quite often. So what happens in these groups is that um, even if you have same ideas, you certainly come from different backgrounds. For this group that I'm talking about, there are people from all over the world almost there. Um, actually, I've happened to interact with people from Africa, Southeast Asia, Asia, predominantly European and um, American and Canadians, everywhere. Mm -hmm. So what they do is and certainly, even though if there are certain personality types or they tend to display or think in certain ways, certainly come from very different cultural backgrounds. So that means that they come with their own baggage. Um, and if they do, um, they certainly talk about um, these ideas out loud. And then other people can give their input on how things are done in their own culture. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly, sometimes it can be very contrasting. Now, when it does contrast, if um, people on both sides are mature enough, and then they're looking for ultimate truth and authenticity in the conversation and trying to find out um, the veracity of the statements that other people make. Then they have this you know, constructive discussion talking about, all right, but if you have this argument, then how do you answer this? And if you think that's a fact, what do you have to corroborate your statement? Mm -hmm. And then comes um, you know, different other research that people give in um, the books um, and research papers and uh, empirical evidences and objective truths or even you know the um, well uh, mutually agreed upon um, observances from different parts of the world so mm -hmm. that also in, enriches um, everyone else's um, ideas um, and opinions on the same topic so they have a different pair of eyes to look the world from and that mm -hmm. certainly is an opportunity that you want to develop if you want to be someone who wants to understand other people's perspective. And I'm only going to speak for um, the people who are the ENFP and INFJ types. Maybe that's um, specific for them, but then certainly in my observation in this group, I found out that these people are generally very curious about authenticity and, and how things work. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly, um, what makes them um, kind of uh, underrepresented in minority because if you look at the statistics at least in us and uk enfps tend to be only five to seven percent people uh, mm -hmm. among the whole population and INFJ is like really unique ones like one percent of any society or at least the research that we have um, and if you tend to be an INFJ male then you're generally called in uh, the vernacular the unicorn <laughs> Is yeah, I'm an INTJ. <laughs> oh, really? They, yeah, they, they say female INTJ is like less than 1%. Yeah, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Exactly, so you're going to feel the loneliness, or at least the intellectual cornering of how it works. So Yeah, well, I think that's interesting, because yeah. I was going to ask if you feel like a lot of the people in this group tend to skew towards having more more higher education. That exactly is true, actually, um, because I don't think um, it has anything to do with education, but it certainly have a very different perspective of the word. I mm -hmm. mean, um, as part of um, um, psychology, if you were to um, some kind of uh, do some kind of stereotyping, there were certainly people with some kind of um, cognitive dissonance, and then they look at and simple phenomena around the world in very different way, interpreted in very different ways. Um, so even if it, there tend to be very confused but then very very open-minded and liberal they score mm -hmm. very high on agreeableness uh and they are also scoring good scores and openness but then they're very low in conscientiousness mm. well that makes exactly a very good social justice warrior <laughs> the only <laughs> problem is that they don't know how to fix the word because they do not have the consistency to do that mm -hmm. INFJ on the other side are very idealistic you know, they're mm -hmm. finding the ultimate truth um and their only purpose is in life is to develop people so that they get ultimate satisfaction and um, a sense of self-worth by improving other people's lives. So that makes them great teachers and counselors mm -hmm. and healers.
Um, and I, I guess in the same way, um, IN teachers are also sometimes um, nominated as the best match for ENFPs because they're very methodical and deep going and finding out um, the truth. Um, and if that is actually a fact and not someone's opinion. So they're very good at dissecting other people's arguments and um, deciphering the truth from the opinions. So mm -hmm. these are actually the kind of people who generally tend, even if not um, formal education, like a university or school or college at some point, they mm -hmm. certainly have done a lot of reading or have um, have been extroverts enough to you know listen to smart people um, mm -hmm. and they crave for new ideas and um, mm -hmm. find out the solutions for social problems and how to fix the world in general. So very dreamlike and um, um, emotional and visionary about um, the way the world works. Mm -hmm. So this is what I think kind of um, makes it a good conversation um, when it comes to these group interactions. Cool. So I'm wondering if you can tell me about like a specific time when maybe your view on something changed as a result of a book discussion that you participated in. Hmm. I go down the memory lane for a minute. <laughs> Um, actually, I'm going to broach a topic which is kind of, a, uh, which is more controversial um, in terms of intercultural sensitivity because um, the culture where I come from, um, we certainly do not have this huge debate about transgender people. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly there is no big dichotomy um, be between, uh, there's nothing between a male and a female. So, you know, if you are someone um, biologically um, born in between, are you some kind of, um, you're displaying signs of um, being a homosexual um, or a lesbian? It certainly is not something that um, you would like to display. Or um, it's not even considered something that's genetic makeup, but we do not back it up with science. I mean, it's supposed to be something that, that is abnormal. Um, mm -hmm. And that I think even in um, DSM uh, one, um, the psychological um, and statistical, statistical manual, uh, the first version of that it was listed as a disorder, but then you know um, they took it out of that. On the mm -hmm. other hand, it becomes a very um, serious issue when you discuss it with Western audiences, um, where it's supposed to be something that has um, been a part of um, social canon for a long time now that you know there is certain rights for these homosexuals and lesbian and transgender it's okay to be that and then um, there's a huge controversy these days about um, this MMA fighter who's a transgender who actually um, converted from male to female and then she um, or he gets to fight um, in the championship and he pretty much you know um, hung everyone out to dry because of course he had um, a male body and then he's been a champion for like what five seven times now and I don't know I got the information most of it like from Joe Rogan's podcast it was mm -hmm. really interesting because I thought it was really, really unfair that she got to um, compete in women's division which is by no um, logical measure is okay to do that because that's, you're not only putting um, women's health in danger but you're also um, a kind of removing a biological line which is simply not removable just by um, your own proclamation of what gender you would like to ascribe to and how other people should address and mm -hmm. it's the same conversation that Jordan Peterson, uh, Peterson had which got him in the pickle with the human resource department and he had to come out and testify in front of um, I think it was Senate hearing about mm -hmm. why he doesn't want university to teach and make it a mandatory trainings or sensitivity training uh, for faculty to uh, have a different pronoun for transgenders and actually force it on other people. Mm -hmm. So anyways, this can be a um, long dragged on discussion, but from the perspective of intercultural sensitivity, when you bring these things out in 
um, a Facebook group and then you have this conversation, it certainly becomes very supercharged. Mm -hmm. Because I do understand that when you bring these things, which are part of a set um, act in stone law uh, in your part of the world, then which is absolutely hilarious for art at some point, you know, or not that serious um, for many people around the world. And I think around 100 years ago, it was the same in Western Canada also when it comes to biblical laws. Um, and it, it's been same in the, um, the Old and New Testaments. It, it's going to be fi found there also. So um, anyways, um, this can create a huge issue. Sometimes it's um, more of a um, sign of a disrespect. And then um, they can get into heated discussions about what does the science support that or not? I mean, do other mam mammals display same behavior or not? And then the discussion is about are human beings um, like other mammals and is it okay to give examples of other people in the animal kingdom uh, and apply it to human beings and in psychology it's also been a huge um, topic of debate uh, whether experiments done on mice is um, replicable with human beings and if they are not and certainly there's no ethical law that allows you to have the same experiment with human beings then where's the evidence that it's the transferability is the same with human beings and mm. if it's not then certainly there's no argument mm. so you know um because when you come from a monotheistic religion which is like what two three billion people mm. around the world then there's certainly no concept of the fact that you know, human beings actually evolved from apes or whatever animal you you know want to name it because you know they're supposed to be the supreme race you know creation um argument so it gets um, down a rabbit hole, which is quite <laughs> yeah. deep. <laughs> so, so yeah, so these, these are some of the discussions that we have had on the group, and you know, certainly it doesn't end anywhere. So, mm -hmm. I mean, but so would you say that maybe your perspective or view on that you were talking about transgender on that subject changed as a result of this discussion, or you still feel like you felt the same way about, you, you know, like you heard another perspective, but you still feel the same way at the end of it. Um, let me put it that way. I think at least now I know how to talk about that mm -hmm. <laughs> in, a, in a different way um, that I would normally do because that, uh, out of a sudden now I have a mental construct that's for some people, you know, it's a um, more sensitive um, topic than others because you know even if you look at the numbers um, of the uh, this uh, class that we're talking about or this um, group or this minority minority group um, mm -hmm. then we're talking about only like what 0.9 or 0.1 percent people of the whole population for example but like if you have 300 million people in a nation and if you're talking about the whole population of transgender or homosexual lesbian people then what is like a million at max if you're exaggerating that or what five seven eight ten million that's mm -hmm. still le less than one person people i mean why are we you know overly focusing these people in an attempt to show that you know you're the best social justice warrior ever i mean there are other <laughs> important things mm -hmm. also like education and healthcare and sanitary thing and then political unrest um democracy and things like that so why talk about these things because that makes somehow makes you look like you were cooler or you know you're a more kind person or i mean what what's the deeper motive behind that so why mm -hmm. focusing on that but then certainly it's in itself it's a good um you know topic for debate whether it's actually proven by science or not um, and if it does what does it actually mean and then mm -hmm. there are research studies that show that um homosexuality actually has its grounds in um, bad parenting especially have a very bad relationship with your um, father or absent father um, and there's a book called the fatherless society um, mm -hmm. has very good insights about um, how adolescent life can be affected by the first six years and actually the first four to six years are the years where you actually develop the foundations of your mental makeup and then afterwards it's just like building on that foundation how much how skewed that is or how tangential that is um mm -hmm. that doesn't really matter and it simply builds on that um mm -hmm. it's also been proven that you know on every measure of iq and um, stability the um, children with both parents outperform everyone else people with no parents people with single parent um, um or foster care there's no debate about that but then if you bring all these arguments and then you still 
um, talk about these issues. Well, it's fine if you take your argument that um, homosexuals could be as good parents as um, everyone else, but it certainly doesn't show itself when it comes to evidence. I mean, are they scoring the same scores on IQ, the school performance, or the mental stability in terms of uh, temperament and um, cognitive results and creativity? The depression rate is um, very high in uh, homosexual population. Um, suicide rate is very high. Um, and generally, it's also, especially when it comes to lesbians, the female also are more prone to have depression as in comparison to males. And then when it comes to lesbians, they have twice as much depression as normal females, um, or to put it more sensitive, sensitively, um, heterosexual um, females. So I mean, if it doesn't give you the evidence that you're basing your argument on, um, then certainly there is a lacuna in between. And mm -hmm. would you recognize that or, you know, shift your behavior or at least thinking in some ways, or you just, you know, simply argue for the sake of argument. Um, so these arguments actually do prolong, but then it certainly gives me um, a different uh, frame of reference um, or way to approach these discussions for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But I won't say that, you know, it, actually has um, shifted, I have shifted, shifted my position on that because um, I would be more than happy to do that if I have the evidence for that. And unfortunately, the you know, evidence is in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so kind of on the other side of that, instead of, uh, I guess, instead of changing your belief, have you ever felt like alienated in a discussion? Mm. Well, to set things out straight, and I've never been the most favorite person in the discussion anyway, but because that <laughs> is, um, I do not really uh, find um, all discussions uh, worth participating because some of the time it's uh, about some kind of silly memes or a stereotype um, or funny videos and cat videos and things like that. And um, well, it's fine, I can watch them, but then I don't know if I have something to reply to that except for an occasional like or love button <laughs> but then uh, i don't know, I don't know what else to contribute i mean i don't think it i think it's kind of a typical infj or intj thing i don't know about intj i can speak for myself that you know unless it really requires your critical um um opinion or um yeah your judgment you're not going to gain your wonderful attention that we're, we're designed <laughs> for yeah um because we consider ourselves smart people and you know our time is not that um easy or you know we don't shower our attention to other people for nothing so i mean if it's an intellectual <laughs> discussion and you know people need our wisdom then we're more than happy to do that but then if not mm -hmm. then you know, we just rather enjoy the moment on other people's expense but um when it comes to serious discussions, of course, um, I do take part in that. And at, like I said, in, in one of these examples, um, and it also depends on the uh, people involved in that post or thread. Um, if they're predominantly from the Western world, then I certainly have a lot of people to answer to. But then if there are other people also um, who come from my culture or at least religion or some kind of um, monotheistic religion who understand at least the concept of that, um, mm -hmm. then they you know, chip in or, um, and kind of like my comments if they like it. Um, so I have kind of some kind of, you know, sense of self-worth and support, even though mm -hmm. if it's existent or not, uh, I, I cannot be too sure about. But then, and yes, it depends on the kind of people who are involved in that. But certainly ENFPs are very energetic and um, you know, blasted when it comes to supposed um, injustice with minority um, mm -hmm. groups and and cultures and they come up with their typical um, effervescence and bubbly nature that hey you're not supposed to treat other people with insensitivity and you're not supposed to be sexist you're not supposed to be racist and when you break down things further for them next comment kind of a longer answer when you tell them okay how does it make um, this group more prone to racism or injustice because it does not all we're trying to say is that these are the facts these are the facts from biology these are the facts from um empirical evidence and this is the history of that and these are the books of people have been researching about that these are the scientific papers 
Now, if you get enlightened, I mean, how is that gracious? And then certainly they don't have an answer. <laughs> and then um, maybe, you know, they would just simply label you um, outright um, bigot or um, terrorist or whatever. But then it's certainly it's the end of the debate because there is no argument coming in return. And, you know, I mm -hmm. want to do my own horn here now. Also, maybe, you know, and it's simply being illogical and the only way to find out, I guess, is to ask other people about my comments. But then um, this is generally how these conversations are proceeded. You certainly feel cornered um, in some way. Uh, mm -hmm. But then if you um, if you're really sure about your stance and you're well read and you have uh, strong arguments for that, um, I guess you can be. Um, you can be more tolerant of other people's critique than you. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of mentioned that you haven't quite found a book club that kind of meets your needs yet. Do you kind of have a list of like expectations or requirements uh, kind of in your mind? Like what are you looking for when you find that book club that you'll feel like, ah, yes, this is my place? Um, actually, I think I have a book club and... Um, uh, Facebook, wait a minute. Just, um, yeah, it's called Book Lovers Cafe. Um, mm -hmm. And sorry, you know, I kind of, uh, it's not uh, actually a page, it's a group. Mm -hmm. um, and I joined it like two, three days ago, and I seem to I like it. Um, it certainly wasn't the Goodreads club, which, you know, I had this um, mm -hmm. notion for some reason that, you know, since we have met through um, Book Reads, so it's supposed to be in Book Reads. So now that I don't have this um, um, illusion, so. This is a private group, it's called Book Lovers Cafe. And it, actually, I found the link for this group on Oprah's book also. I think I was searching for some other group. And then there was this a lady, um, and then she, and she had the link for, her name is Angela Caesar. Um, and um, I got to this book through that link on book readers, um, sorry, Goodreads. Mm -hmm. and, and then I joined the group. This is why it's a private group. Um, and people are posting the images of books that they're reading at the moment mm -hmm. and then uh, what they like about it and then other people seem to comment about these ideas to, uh, that have been shared and then they talk about what they like and what they don't and there's some kind of discussion is there but um, i don't really find um, you know lengthy discussions about that i mean they actually had some comments on the book that i shared the biology at work uh, mm -hmm. which led to you know a little bit of back and forth messaging but I guess um, that was it but certainly um, to answer the question what I would really like is um, for example I am also now I'm a top fan of World Economic Forum book club mm -hmm. and uh, to be honest it's uh, such pseudoscience there that they have been posting articles and um, videos and um, books about uh, pretty the liberal um, spectrum or the liberal side of the spectrum that doesn't even withstand the um, inspection of facts um, so that's what I've been writing on, in the comments about how these facts are wrong and then um, people are coming back um, with questions and I do give them different links for the books and scientific papers and certainly we have some good discussion there so it doesn't really have to be a book club but then uh, you can certainly um, you know, find a place where people actually pick a topic or mm -hmm. a book and then make um, some parts of it um, and then you take one topic uh, and then discuss about that and deconstruct your argument and see if that's a fact and then mm -hmm. you move to the next one. I think this is the probably uh, best way to approach a book um, or any topic um, to be honest about um how how to find out if that's the ultimate truth or it's closest to the empirical evidence that we have around in some way trying to make sense of the world um around us um, with reasonable um confidence that um this actually is the truth so i think in any book club that should be um of pivotal importance to uh, find a book and then list the arguments or like the, list the chapters and then deconstruct the arguments that um, they have insight, both the scientific one and the empirical ones, in comparison of world cultures around, um, and then take one by one 
um, and have opinions of everyone else, and then find out if we agree on um, the um, discussions that we have had about this topic, and then move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So the Book Lovers Cafe one you mentioned, is that, do they like assign monthly books to read or is it more just, you just kind of mention what you're reading and if anyone else is reading, there'll be a conversation about it? Um, no, I don't think that they have this um, monthly reading assignment. I mean, what I've seen from the um, wall that they have is there are people posting books that they're reading at the moment with the coffee um, and muffins and everything else. And then, <laughs> yeah. Um, everyone else is commenting. Well, predominantly, I guess it's the females portion, and everyone's so caring about everyone's feeling and question about the books. Hey, wonderful book! Have a nice read, and tell me what's going on and things like that. So I don't know. Uh, it certainly doesn't have the intellectual vigor and aggressiveness that I normally bring to conversations, and get blamed <laughs> for that. Yeah, but I mean, so is that something like, would you prefer to be a part of a group that kind of all agrees on a book to read and then approaches discussion? Or would you like to just be able to be like, oh, I'm reading this. I want to see what other people are saying about it. Yeah, but how would you agree on a book before we actually um, have discussed this together? Because I mean, if you have already agreed, then it certainly means that you've read the book and then you've already made up your mind and then you only find people who agree with you and then, uh, you just simply, you know, um, thump each other's back, good job. Um, <laughs> and that's certainly not a very, um, or at least intellectually empowering way if your ideas are not being questioned at all. Mm -hmm. um, so what you would ideally want to do is that, you know, read your book and then, you know, go to a, a place where the, everyone else is discussing um, this book and then, you know, write your brief review, supposedly, if you're kicking off the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else is going to write, Oh, I guess my understanding of the book is a little bit different um, mm. from these arguments. I think um, he meant that, not that. Um, and the way that you're building your argument upon this foundation is probably a little bit screwed. And then you get back and say, okay, well, if you think that, you know, uh, my understanding of this foundation is not correct, then why does he bring this argument on the page two, three, four, five, or 100 um, in support of the foundation that I'm building on? So maybe um either you point out that the mistake that I, I am making in construing the argument or you use the rest of the book to corroborate your argument that your foundation is right so i mean if there is no intellectual going back and forth um then i don't know how can that be a productive discussion because curative things are a result of uh, constructive objective arguments and if they're not there it's simply a monologue um, lecture that no one understands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of the other groups I've looked at will either, like, the group will have a theme, and then, you know, participants will suggest books, and the group will vote on what they want to read, like a more democratic process, or I, I know some of the other Goodreads groups will just kind of, like, they have moderators that choose the books for the month, and everybody will read those books. Hmm. Um, I guess it's, uh, for example, um, what happens in the World Economic Forum book club, I guess they have a moderator and they pick a book and then they'll leave and oh, okay, this week we're reading this book mm -hmm. and uh, everyone just read this chapter and then we're going to come back and discuss about these things and most of these books are like, you know, mm, they're always on you know, progressive liberal front, uh, very um, high on um, cocaine and myth when it comes to progressive ideas and how we can change the world except you know they don't want to deconstruct the argument and find out what the reality is and even if you want to bring this change I mean how you're actually going to implement the change in a world that does not totally appreciate those ideas or at least understand these ideas because research has also shown that you know majority of the people um, in in the world or in any major society are very slow to adapt to new things and you know, this is why you know, technology still takes a lot of time mm -hmm. for people to adapt especially the older people and very young people and people who are mentally impaired or people with um, lower iqs you know even if you have brilliant ideas and you get there first you know you have to educate people for years if not months to actually come up to speed and realize the importance of the brilliant idea that you have so i mean mm -hmm. if you have good iq and you know yours somehow um, 
you know, super intelligent or gifted, you know, it still is a curse because no one else is going to identify with your ideas and, you know, work at your mind speed unless mm -hmm. you break it down and dumb it down for other people to understand how important that idea is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you don't do that, and this is kind of, of a consistent um, experiments in um, studies done over people who um, lean on the uh, progressive and liberal side of the things that you know they have very high openness to come up with brilliant intellectual ideas problem is that they're very low on conscientiousness that mm -hmm. means that they do not have to study jobs study careers study relationships um, because they're so smart that they're moving one uh, topic to another another topic to a third topic and they're always moving between countries experiencing new things coming up with entrepreneurial ideas um, but then they certainly need a counterpart to actually put these ideas to work mm -hmm. For example, this is why we always have a duo uh, behind a successful venture. Then we've got Steve Jobs, and then we also have, what is that other Steve Bosniak? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we have Bill Gates, and uh, I don't know the name of this friend, friend of that one. Um, and you know, this is always like takes two people with different temperaments. Um, mm -hmm. Same with um, domestic relationships. You, know, you have a very uh, cunning, smart, good with money um, women, and you need you know extra huge spender, waster, take risk taking guy. Extrovert is kind of a typical uh, mindset, or the, or the other way, you have a very you know, caring and sensitive and loving um, and super thoughtful guy, and then you have like crazy, boisterous, um, um, hard pushing extrovert um, wife, and you know it always takes you know one sensible person to you know put other people to leash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, if you bring these ideas to these groups and um, talk about um, these things with um, these other people, they certainly are very high on um, emotions when it's your ideas get shut down. Um, mm -hmm. These groups and these moderators always pick up these books, which are actually kind of reinforcing the um, thoughts or beliefs that these people already have. So it kind of becomes a clique. So the purpose of um having um a, a book read and then deconstructed and argued and in result shifting your um belief system or understanding things in a different way simply has no chance because you're simply selecting the book that you like and then you're simply asking other people to um, corroborate you or encourage you and uh, that's pretty much the end of it i mean if you how often does that happen that you vote for a book and then you select the book that's been least quoted and then you talk about yeah. that mm, interesting then, yeah exactly and then um and if it even if you talk about that you you get all the um ideas um that most of the people agree upon and then the person who has actually voted for the book assuming that they have a different understanding of the book also um they actually highlight the comments and feedback of this person who stands out of the whole crowd and then the their comments are you know pushed um, on the top of and the page or it's been pinned or something like that it certainly doesn't happen i mean is that what you want that's another question because my understanding of um the epistemology of the whole process is that you select a book deconstruct the argument um and let it change your behavior if that's the facts and if it doesn't mm -hmm. do that is it worth it? Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, so I'm curious, you were talking about the moderators a little bit. Um, do you feel like the moderators of these groups are beneficial or what do you think the groups might be like without the moderators? Hmm. I mean, let's talk a little bit about what moderators are there for. Mm -hmm. Now, the term itself, I mean, if you put it that, um, in a different industry or let's say in a different sphere, uh, mm -hmm. if you're moderating a discussion, you're having a panel discussion, your only job is to try to find out um, the truth. Your quest mm -hmm. for truth actually helps you ask the same question without any biasness and fairness from both opponents in order um, for the audience to hear from them and make their own decision. Now, I don't know if um, the job of a moderator on Facebook group is any different. 
they keep the spammers out, they keep the trolls out, <laughs> they keep the discussions um, in perspective, and they make sure they do not take any sides. Um, mm. They highlight the opinions of dissenting people equally, um, and they ask smart um, follow-up questions and actually help people who are not able to um, emphasize or enunciate their ideas in a good way. So you can ask them questions that would help them talk about the things um, that um, are a little bit confusing um, in audiences um, perception about what this person wants to say. Um, so you're basically kind of, we're kind of working as a speech therapist who's helping someone talk about um, things that other people want to hear about. Now, if that's not the purpose of moderation, if they're taking sides or if they're encouraging people about, oh, that's a great idea and that fits in with our Western civilization or that fits in with um, Asian civilization or wherever you uh, happen to be from, I mean, it's simply taking sides, but you're trying to, what you're supposed to do actually is talk about the basic argument within the book um, mm -hmm. and not um, give people um, any kind of support or encouragement because to be honest, it, it, um, your only job is to be an investigator of truth. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you certainly are impartial. And what happens in some of these groups is that, you know, well, let's take the word economic forum. Um, to take an extreme example, well, an easy example would be this other um, book club about book lovers cafe, where, you know, people simply, you know, boozy, they're just feeling, hey, good job, I hope you read this book, and, you know, flowers and cake and everything else. I mean, that's certainly, um, it's a good way to actually help other people to feel good about their effort of reading, but then when it comes to intellectual enrichment, um, mm. let's have another um an example of uh, World Economic Forum books. So, you know, they select the book and then they say, okay, now we're going to be reading this chapter this weekend. And this is what this chapter is about. And everyone pitches in their idea. And then, um, for example, if we're talking about um, some of the controversial um, issues, well, let's pick up a book about um, feminine mystique or uh, biology at work or Kevin McDonald's uh, work on um, anti Semitism and uh, contribution of Jewish intellectuals in the 20th century. Um, of a lot of uh, immigration policies and richer circles or whatever conspiracy theory that we can think of. If we were to be discussing these ideas, you really think these moderators are not going to shut down people who are somehow happen to be conservative or even supporting um, these ideas. I mean, let's blow it out of proportion if they were supporting eugenics or things like that. Do you really think that they were going to give them a platform or where is it? They can comment about these ideas no matter how scientifically well these comments are for example and that's not the made, made up argument for example the, uh, the bell curve um it's a very controversial book about iq mm -hmm. um charles Merritt talks about um the iq difference between the black americans and latinos and white americans and asian americans so they found out that the asian americans tend to have the highest iq um of mm -hmm. all and then it's the whites and then it's um, Latino, then in the end, it's black. Now, what do you make out this argument? Now, it certainly is very easy to um, hand out the um, bronze award for racism in that, which is, you know, pretty sensible when you put it in the context. But then the problem is, uh, is this an argument that is based on opinion, or is it a fact? Is it um, does it come out of a lot of scientific um, studies, e years after years, year after year? I mean, cross-cultural context, it's around the globe and it's stayed consistent. Now, we can all, always argue about the fact that, you know, there might be better explanations for that, but certainly the results are not um, very, com uh, well, let's say disputable in some ways. And it certainly does not mean that you're um, mitigating any of these talents. For example, they happen to be very, very good athletes. Um, many of these um, long marathon runners are people from um, Kenya. Uh, especially this one tribe. Um, musical talents are wonderful when, uh, when people generally come from Nigeria. Um, why is that, that most of the um, rap song um, singers are from African American tradition? Now, that also means that, you know, people have different talents um, and different um, predilections when it comes to um, what they want to do in their work. It's certainly by no measure um, is a denigration of their 
um, capabilities. But mm. when it comes to the book clubs, do you really think that people are going to be talking about that? Because, you know, once something is shut down, you know, it's, it's to be pushed under the um, rug and never to be talked about again. And then if you, know, you find someone slightly on the opposite side, you shut them down immediately. Mm-hmm. Now, I can totally understand, you know, if you, that depends on how, how and why you want to make a book club. So if, if your purpose is, to uh, make sure that people with, with like-minded ideas are going to be in the group to bring different books, and we talked about that. And then we're going to support each other, and you know, it's an intellectually elite exercise uh, where rich country club uh, men and women can sit and enjoy their uh, erudition and lock them up up in ivory tower. Well, by all means, do that. But mm. if, it, if that's not what you want to do, that then why have a moderator? I mean, if you have a moderator, it's fine, but then if they're not doing their job and they're interrupting actually and taking sides, who really want that? Because I would assume that if you want to have um, open discussion where you're, you come uh, with bare hands and ready to be um, proselytized um, by any good idea that um, shifts your opinion on um, how you want to view things and uh, you do not come with a closed mind there you certainly want to see a you know debate happening um and ideas um, and evidence is coming to the fore that's going to revolutionize the way you think about things or at least um give you an insight into existing phenomenon and a new way to think about that now if a moderate does not even let that happen what is your take away from that I mean, so it sounds like your concern is that moderators are kind of encouraging the echo chambers rather than helping keep the group fair for all. Well, isn't it the ideal um, purpose um, of having a moderator? So, I mean, my ultimate goal is that these groups should be a place to obtain diverse perspectives not to reinforce our own beliefs. So yeah, I agree that the moderator should be making, if you have a moderator, the purpose of the moderator should be like making sure that everyone can make their voice heard in the group. Okay, well, let me read that for you. Um, the November post uh, from World Economic Forum. So there's a book, um, early announcement, it's called, um, thank you all for joining us with Brad Smith and Carolyn Browns tools and weapons. We obviously still have most of the book to go, but wanted to announce our November pick. So you have more time to grab your copy. And then it goes to for our November pick. Um, it's Mark Benioff's Braille Blazer. Now, let's have a look at what it's about. So um, this um, author is going to be um, on Facebook Live where people could have, ask questions and their tweets. And then you have a Twitter handle of WEF Book Club. And there is a super cool poster on that. And 108 people have liked that. And we have only seven comments. Now, the book link is on trail, uh, on Goodreads. And what it says is that um, the founder and co-CEO of Salesforce delivers an inspiring vision for the future of business. One is which anyone is empowered to change the world. Now, if you take a step back and think about the whole idea, first of all, if you're giving all the details about the writer, his Twitter handle, and um, he's going to be in the video and you can ask him questions and um, his email address and Google Reads account and where you can buy it, purchase the book. Do you really think that's all happening because uh, people want to discuss his ideas and not um, buy the book? Uh, it's more of a, for the way I see it, it's kind of a marketing stunt. And then mm-hmm. why again you choose a book that features highly successful and um, rich men talking about the grand vision of how they can change the world despite mm-hmm. all the unfair practices that we um, see in terms of accounting and reporting standards um, of these companies. Um, the CEO wage gap is when highest in the US with 259 to one against um, CEO pay and the wage worker pay. And then we have, Certainly, the New York Times bestseller, uh, 
title with that. Do you really think that we're choosing these books because you know they really are making a difference around the world and everyone in the world wants to read that? Hmm. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. It does sound like more of a marketing approach than anything there. Yeah, and let's look at the comments also. I mean, let's not you know jump to conclusions about what moderators want to sell here. Now there are comments, and um, there are people um, asking for um, different books and um, what they think about it. For example, this one post is "Hello everyone, I'm interested in the most mind-expanding book you have read. A book that altered your mindset or created a massive change in your life. Mine is mm -hmm. Sapiens, mm -hmm. um, which is a good, good one. Um, mm -hmm. And after explaining the role that fiction played in human history, it turned me from agnostic to an atheist." Well, that's quite a jump. Um, and then you have um, some kind of, you know, comment grill going where people are giving their own um, um, comments with the books that and they find um, life changing, which is really interesting. I mean, this, these are the kind of posts that I really like. I mean, this, this is more like a per person to person interaction. Mm -hmm. And in the comments, you know, people can go through other books and if they don't know about that. Um, by the way, there's another project which I um, have recently stumbled upon and find it really interesting. It is called Project Alexandria. Mm -hmm. um, and what you do is you simply write a book and then it makes um, a mind map of books which are similar to that. And then mm -hmm. you click to another book and then it gives you another um, mind map with the books that are similar. It's a very interesting one. You should have a look at that. Yeah, that sounds really cool. And it's called Project Alexandria .net. Um okay. I recently found that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, if you're talking about uh, a moderator's interference or not, um, that kind of becomes irrelevant if people are discussing um, about the books uh, with each other through the post. But then mm. certainly um, a moderator um, becoming a you know, judge and a jury certainly is, I don't think how it's, it can be helpful in pursuit of um, mm -hmm honest answers yeah yeah i know sometimes moderators really just wind up being like they have to keep spam and stuff out of the group but uh <laughs> exactly. yeah uh so i want to be conscious of your time because we've already been going for an hour no it's fine I, i'm really enjoying that as okay as i mean i do have a couple more questions if you have if you have time but i just sure. wanted to okay yeah i just want to make sure you don't have anywhere else to be so I'm curious if you've ever left any of these groups or any kind of book club. Uh, well, like I said, I'm pretty new to this fashion, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if I've left that or not because I'm still part of that. Um, it could be a physical meeting group too, if there's one that you used to meet up with in your area and you stopped going to. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I'm a part of a town um, where we don't have that, even though I'm just very trying to find a book club, but I, just, <laughs> yeah. you know, I have to be a founder. But then, uh, um, no, I haven't done that on Facebook, at least. But then at some point, you know, um, if you don't find what you're looking for, you simply at least um, actively, um, you know, you don't simply go to the group. You know, it sometimes, you mm -hmm. know, hides itself somewhere down the um, scrolling um drag on your facebook timeline um mm -hmm. yeah that's what um, happens but off and on um you know simply go in and see if there's a book that i haven't seen because i think you know i'm doing a pretty good job or at least i think i'm satisfied with whatever time i have left by getting the alert from uh, new york times bestsellers and um howard publishing press and jail publishing press and then you know i'm also on research gate where all my research is mm -hmm. um, so at least a scientific um, part of that i can get it from there i can simply search for the topic that i'm interested in and then i have a library um well, it's an online library some kind of papyrus thing i don't know if, if you can put that in your interview <laughs> but i find my <laughs> book there um mm -hmm. and um they also have kind of suggest suggesting mechanism where you could find out if um the book other people who search for this book i've also searched for that one of other mm -hmm. kind of te technological um benefit you can get from amazon is that you know search for a book and then you could scroll down and see other people um who have written similar books or then you can just simply read the description and review and think oh well that's worth having a look so i think you know this other drill is quite beneficial 
and keeps mm-hmm. my hand full um, mm-hmm. with a lot of things. And then I also have classics. I mean, this is what happens with a lot of um, book readers um, and the member of the book clubs also. It's not only that you're looking for new books and new ideas all the time. Sometimes, you know, you want to go back to your old classics that you really want to have in hard copy, you know, get a mm-hmm. cup of coffee, enjoy your winter, have popcorn, and you know, read and, you know, remember how the first time it charmed you and seduced <laughs> you. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know you have your love relationship with your oldies yeah <laughs> um so how do you feel participation in these groups or sorry what do you feel like they have done for you like on a personal level hmm. that's a deep one <laughs> I mean, uh, if you dissect that, um, and why do actually people go there? Now, there could be a couple of um, common sense answers to that. One is to search for books. Now, when you have searched for a book, um, the logical question is, what now? Why are you part of the group anymore? Now, certainly, if you happen to be someone who have read this book, you certainly want to go back and talk about the book. Um, and that's where the discussion part comes in. Now, what happens to most of these groups is, that you go back with the summary of the book and then someone else is commenting on that. And that's where the conversation starts, um, you know, warming up. The other way is that you simply go there and you want to interact with people. Um, well, to be honest, it's, it's um, we shouldn't deny the human component of and why we um, become part of these groups. Um, well, let's talk about this um, other personality group that I'm part of. Why am I a part of those groups? I mean, if simply think out loud it is because you know trying to find out like-minded people who I generally don't find because I'm part of a unicorn community and then it's not really easy to be able to um, share your ideas without other people judging you and not appreciating if um, there is you know some um, sense of um, or there's some depth in my um, ideas which people of my kind would find easily and that's the same thing that happens to book clubs also when you go to these book clubs you pe- see people commenting on other people's comment and um, your um, posts and things like that and then you pick up um, a general pattern on okay oh, this person thinks that way and then maybe you have something to say if I ask some of the um, deeply buried questions that I've always had about this book or generally about some other topic and then you you know drop a line about oh, okay if you think that way about um, this issue what about this other issue that I've always had a question about and then they get back to you on um, that issue and then you start talking about these things so it's not mm-hmm. only about the search for a book um, or search for friends it's also about search for people who are going to give you the answers for the question which has nothing to do with any books or any groups mm-hmm. you know what I mean so yeah. you're actually kind of using it um, similarly or simultaneously um, as I mean, as a book club primarily and then um, um, soul-searching website and as a secondary purpose of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I have made some um, friends from these groups um, that I can probably share a lot of um, things and, you know, they get me without actually judging. Um, on those ideas because you know they themselves had these questions some were deep uh, buried um, which are kind of social taboos or um, let's say simple intellectual hearsays um, so I mean even if you don't think these book clubs as the ultimate um, destination of uh, or source of um, quenching all your um, your thirst for um, knowledge and answer it still is a is a place where you can find like-minded people where you can share other parts of your life mm-hmm. yeah definitely so the last question i had is if you could have any feature in an online book club what would it be and it could be you know doesn't have to be prob- easily built yeah, you can think big <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah i think um 
to put the puzzle pieces together. This website that I've stumbled upon, Project Alexandria, I find it really, really interesting because, um, like I said, we were talking about bell curve um, mm. uh, before. Um, when I put the book bell curve in the Project Alexandria, it gave me two, three, four other books that mm. were related to the same um, category. And one of that was also by Charles Murray, which I found really, really interesting social dissection and, um, and, and an anatomical examination of how um, U.S. society has become. It's called Coming Apart. Mm -hmm. And it does discusses a lot about um, how there are two classes built um, in U.S. One is the um, liberal uh, middle class um, that's gotten to upper middle class and super rich. And then there is um, the working class, blue collar workers mm -hmm. have become um, a lot more these days. So middle class is kind of evaporating and then um, he's also talking a lot about the characteristics of uh, these lower classes and the super rich classes so there was time when they used to go out fox hunting sitting in country clubs um, and playing tennis um, and now these they're also um, six-figure um, income um, journalists and um, ivy league graduates professors um, where they have certain habits of traveling abroad, doing yoga, putting a lot of effort in their um, careers um, in terms of their accomplishments, um, why is that important um, to have um, certain prerequisites before the children, you know, at what time to marry and things like that. And he has a lot of numbers about that also. For example, mm -hmm. the general um, age that they Marries around 32 to 35, um, and then uh, they generally have only one to two kids, and um, it takes them a long time to actually make up their mind to get married. Um, on the other side, if you go to the blue collar side, most of these people um, marry um, in high school or slightly after high school, and then they have children, or sometimes, or most of the time, accidentally, and then um, then they have uh, only one year of um, college or maybe even less than that some people even drop out from high school go straight to the work and then they have um, um, you know, slightly above average above, above the country average children and then their um, average incomes kind of um, go up and down and things like that um, their beliefs about um, church and religion and society about women they're very set in stone um, so they don't give much um, thought about um, how the world has changed and that, what that might mean for them and um, general about society. They're not very um, likely to intellectualize about uh, events happening on the other part of the world. So these are kind of the salient features of these two classes. And then he talks about how 1960 was the um, changing era of all that um, mm -hmm. with the decades of 70s, 80s um, when the feminists um, came in full blown power. And then he shows that how the general, um, uh, he took most of his data from National Census um, Bureau um, in the US and he argues with that, that you know, um, with a lot of those assumptions that people had before. Uh, for example, and let's take one of those indicators about um, child uh, birth uh, out of wedlock. Uh, when they had this um, survey back in 1960s, around uh, overwhelming majority of them, um, those women supported the idea that women should always be married when they have children um, or at least be engaged or something like that. Very few of them even um, discounted the idea of having children even when you're engaged. Well, fast forward 2005, majority of them think that's okay. And you know, um, high representation of these women are still from um, the high school dropout uh, majority, but then this idea never goes away. I don't know if that's still the religious remnants or um, it's part of um, the society, the global society in general and the stereotype um, that that's how it's always done. So it should be that, um, but increasingly more uh, women think it's fine. You know, if you're not uh, married, you can still have it. Child. So this this was the book that I actually got out of recommendation. I found it interesting to read because I'm still writing a research paper. Let's say I don't know if that comes out as a book or a paper, but then I'm trying to translate all these ideas to society in Pakistan and see if all the statistics from our national uh, statistics bureau 
um, converge with the same result that he has. And I have a feeling that it does uh, mm -hmm. because um, it's not too hard to empirically find out um, the fact that does it actually make um, a woman's life harder um, or easier? And certainly need um, a woman um, input in that also. And so I've certainly been asking around because I certainly do not want to risk uh, being uh, called a sexist, um, even though when these ideas are coming out of facts that um, does it make her life easier or not? Because what we know from the facts is that from the age um, 16 to 24, that's the peak uh, range where the attractiveness of a woman is on, at the peak. And uh, this is, um, has been um, shown over and over through studies. With the men, their attractiveness peaks when they're over 40. And that is um, probably one of the reasons for, or at least the evolutionary um, explanation of that is that, you know, men are chosen for their social status and women are chosen for their beauty. Mm. How often do you actually um, see a man rejecting a woman saying, oh, well, she doesn't have enough ambition and I don't see her succeeding in her career? Almost never. Mm. How does that, um, often does it happen that a woman rejects a man because, you know, he's not beautiful? Um, so, I mean, if, if you look at these arguments, which are simply empirical, um, and then you also have studies when it comes to the scientific part of that. Um, it, so how it happens is that you have um, um, a, a, a statistical data on um, the average age of marriage, uh, how many spouses are earning, for example, um, the data test on uh, pediatric doctors, um, what they found out that um, around 80% of um, male working uh, spouses, um, their wives are not working. But um, around, um, yeah, I think it was overwhelming with majority also that if you're a female, your spouses are always working. And But if you're a male, they tend not to work because they have stable income at house and they prefer to stay with their kids and family, which is an opposite. Absolutely um, understand, understandable uh, phenomenon if that's what they want to do. Mm. But then what, is it, what does it leave us with? Uh, the fact that um, these, um, uh, these results are replicable throughout the years. And in Pakistan um, Census Bureau, the data that I've gotten exactly show the same thing. But anyway, the point was that if I hadn't found the, that book from Project Alexandria, uh, I wouldn't even know that that existed. What does mm. it even mean? But then um, my idea about um, how to structure a a good book club is that if we could simply um, integrate this project Alexandria in that in some of the book clubs uh, for example we could have an API or something and integrate that um, in discussion and then together you could put a name of the book and then you could have four or five other suggestions and then, then you could vote on okay which book should we read and then we have a you know, reasonably um, decent moderate like we talked about and then we can you know break down the chapters and then we can take one by one and um, talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, so I think that's just something that would be super nice. Okay. So I'm curious, with that in mind, do you think having, and I, obviously I haven't looked at Project Alexandria in depth, I, I just pulled it up here, but are you concerned that this might reinforce like the echo chamber issue where like you put in something that you like and you keep getting more stuff you like rather than being given books that challenge your view? How do you mean? Uh, I mean, like I said, I don't know exactly how Alexandria suggests related books, but I mean, like, you might just keep well, getting easy, you know? books that let's... put forth the same ideas rather than giving you, like, challenging opinions to what you're reading. Well, let's not build an argument on um, assumption. Why don't you just go ahead and book, uh, put the name of a book um, in the project and let's see what do you get. Uh, you want me to put in something specific or just anything? Well, whatever you want, um, so that you can at least see when you get the suggestion that if that's something related or... Um, yeah, I mean, I put in like, I mean, I read a lot of fictions. So like, I put in Jane Austen. I put in like Emma or Pride and Prejudice. And I'm like, I got, I got like Candide, Black Beauty, uh, Pinocchio. <laughs> 
So I. Yeah, basically. So what he's trying to do is that Kendi has nothing to do with Jane Austen. Right. Um, and you know that century apart also, I guess. Mm. Um, so it doesn't really um, mean that you know, all the books are going to be recommended um, from the same author or even the same century or same genre. Um, mm. So I guess they have a complex algorithm that tells you that you know, um, or maybe it, it is coming out of um, the sales um, indicators for big websites like Amazon or eBay or something, and and mm. that tells you that readers who have read this book have also been um, observed to show interest in these other books. And even despite that, if we take your argument at face value that um, if you put a book in and all other books are related and that creates an echo chamber, I mean, that necessarily is not the case uh, because what I think is that, you know, even if you have a book that's r similar to the suggested books, when you read that, I mean, and if you have a reasonably diverse population, people with different temperaments and cultural backgrounds um, and um, create uh, prevalence, they are still going to be uh, coming up with different ways of looking at the same thing, and that's going mm -hmm. to end up giving you a richer insight on um, how traditionally understood um, ideas about that book and that book can be challenged. If mm -hmm. not, I mean, if everyone still agrees on that, there's still a room for um, people coming from um, a very um, hostile or at least the um, opposite um, cultural understanding um, where that's a tab when they would come up with their own opposition um, which at least will then give you a reason to question your own understanding of that and mm -hmm. that will result in um, necessarily not having an echo chamber mm -hmm. yeah I agree cool Okay, well, that's all the questions I have. <laughs> oh, that's um, very interesting. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I was just wondering, is it for your paper or is it for your dissertation or what? Yeah, so this is my, uh, in HCI we do like a, a project instead of a dissertation. So ultimately what this is leading to is I'll design like a prototype of a new online platform for book clubs and then I'll get hopefully get some feedback on the prototype to improve it and then that'll probably be the end of the project <laughs> oh, that's very nice uh, if you need any better testers I'd be more than happy to do that okay yeah that probably won't be till the spring but if you're interested I'll definitely keep you in mind okay great I'm actually just wondering I mean, this conversation has given me a lot of um, thoughts about you know how wonderful this uh, project is I mean if actually materialize somehow I mean that would be a um, new way of looking and interacting um, um, how we look at books and how we read books and how we interact. We're just wondering, would you be interested in talking about that on a you know, I'm sure podcast episode? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've really enjoyed getting your perspective. I mean, with the social psychology background at, or sorry, personality psychology. Uh, I, I think it's fascinating, but uh, yeah, I mean, definitely this is, Although this is only a project for my master's, I'm contemplating going into my PhD and continuing this kind of stuff. So it's definitely something I'm really passionate about and want to see, keep working on in the future. So definitely. Exactly. Because I had one of the teachers, um, also from the U.S., but he lives in Nepal, he teaches mm -hmm. high school kids, um, was visiting me um, like a month ago. And we talked about that and it's already on um, YouTube. So I can send you the link for that also. So I have like diverse guests um, mm -hmm. coming in and talking about ideas and I'm really fascinated about people um, and how they're, you know, creating new ways of um, interacting and building new things. And you know, mm -hmm. as much um, opportunity I get, you know, I try to get them um, on my podcast so that they can, you know, their ideas are recorded somewhere and it's not lost in the books and, you know, um, archives of university library. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I would be down. I've never been on a podcast before. So I guess if you could give me some questions beforehand or tell me what to expect, that would probably help. But yeah, I don't mind talking about it more. <laughs> sure, that'd be great. Uh, just let me know when you're um, available, I guess, you know, uh, right now you've got a lot on your plate um, or maybe not, <laughs> um, whenever you have. Um, yeah, I'll will. have more time in December. Things are kind of crazy right now, but yeah, in December would be better. Okay, you got no one to celebrate Christmas with or what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I didn't mean on Christmas, but I, 
you know, I get a break in school for a couple of weeks there around Christmas, so I'll have a little more time. <laughs> All right, perfect. I'll just yeah. plan for that. Okay, sounds good. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. That was a wonderful conversation, and good luck with your project. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye.